My name is Jessica Brinkworth, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and I'm an evolutionary immunologist that focuses on severe infectious disease. I run across monkeypox a lot because I tend to do comparative primate immunology, and if you're digging into the literature and doing background on monkeys and disease, you run into monkeypox material all the time, um, pretty incessantly, because monkeypox, even though it's a disease that's naturally hosted by, uh, or rather its natural host, is a series of rodents in, in uh, Western Central Africa, including the rope squirrel, uh, it was first discovered in monkeys, and not only that, it has a fantastic host range. So there are like many different primate species that it's infected, many different rodent species at a minimum that's infected. So why do we call it monkeypox if we largely find it in rodents? Uh, it was first reported, because we found it by accident, like we find most things. <laughs> um, it was first reported in 1958 in research monkeys in Denmark. Uh, and the primary host, like I said, appears to largely be African rodents, and the rope squirrel is a uh, lead contender for a major natural host. And we know, though, that it's highly, like we can be communicated very readily to the rodent populations that live in North America because there was an outbreak in 2003 stemming from rodent importation from West Africa as pets, and these animals got were commingled with prairie dogs in Illinois, like pet prairie dogs. And then there was an outbreak in Wisconsin stemming from the purchase of those prairie dogs. The outbreak was identified in May, stemming from travel to Nigeria and uh, was found in the UK and I believe in Germany among people who had traveled to Nigeria and participated in a particular um, rave event. And since that time, it's been traveling among first social networks. So in any disease where you have human to human communication, diseases travel in social networks. And so uh, it traveled along um, networks of men who have sex with men and then eventually a broader community. 1.4 to 1, an R naught of 1.4 to 1.8 is important. That suggests, so keep in mind that most people in Europe will have no prior exposure to this disease. So when we do these estimates of R naughts, when people talk about this disease as like really not being that infective and they're pulling R naughts out of the literature from Africa specifically, A, the burden in Africa is really, really difficult to estimate because the surveillance is not there. Um, it's not very strong in most regions where this this disease tends to circulate. And then secondly, you can assume prior exposure. So already you're going to have longer standing immunity, um, potential like long standing immunity to this disease. So it would be lower or would appear lower. So you can assume that like, just because the burden is so difficult to estimate and it's, a, it's like in, in West Africa, um, it would be difficult to make any conclusions about it now. Now it's moving among what we assume is a largely naive population, meaning immunologically naive population. So people who haven't been exposed before have any history. Um, and it's at a 1.4 to 1.8. So if it's 1.8, that's just shy of exponential. Both of these things are higher than endemicity, meaning that like it's on its own without outside inputs, one, one case will give rise to 1.4 to 1.8 without mitigation. That's the definition, right? So um, it sits around what we would attribute ordinarily to the seasonal flu. So it's communicable. It's, it's very communicable. And I think that the sense of it being both, because um, I've gotten multiple public health messages from different um, public health authorities saying this is a rare disease, it's not that communicable. I think our sense of that is really distorted by the fact that A, things are only rare is a relative term. So if you have an outbreak, stuff is not rare. And B, 
Our sense of transmissibility, I think, has been really distorted by COVID, which is highly transmissible and has always transmitted at an exponential rate and is now ridiculously transmissible with an R naught of at least 10, right? And so it's easy to look at that disease and say, okay, well, that's the bar. And when it's not, I mean, so it's transmissible. It's as transmissible as the seasonal flu. Therefore, it should be a cause of concern. And these numbers are very likely distorted by a couple of other factors, including subclinical infections where people are not expressing symptoms, but they're still communicable. And the fact that it has this super long incubation period, which makes things not great. So the incubation, so the clinical information, um, the incubation is four to 21 days. Early signs of, of illness follow this period of four to 21 days, so four days to three weeks. And they include things like lymph nodes are swollen, headache, fever, muscle aches. So all those things seem like it could be something else, right? But then there's a couple of really characteristic things that happen in this stage. So there's back pain that happens and it's an intense lack of energy, just intense fatigue like really out of it, cannot move. It's an intense fatigue. Um, there's pharyngitis, drenching night sweats, and malaise. So this is the kind of thing where like, if you're having those things happen, it's a little harder to dismiss it as any number of other things, but it's still easy to confuse with, with other diseases. So this is where it gets, um, where people need to be more aware of what the symptoms are. Uh, after that point, so sometime after that 40 to 21 days, people get pustules. So these are these lesions and they start out flat and then they get raised and then they get more raised and then they crest up and they fall off. They will appear over one to 10 days. They tend to max out in their generation in 10 days and they tend to start on the face and then they cover the whole body. And so this is something that makes it different from other types of pox viruses with specifically smallpox and that people tend to have uniform distribution. Um, these lesions, they can get kind of big. They can be pea-sized and they tend to be super hard. So I think that the way that people might think about it would be the way that we tend to think about, say like herpes cold sores or other ways that like um, chicken pox, which is a herpes virus. We tend to think about those things. Um, we think of them as being sort of liquid filled. They can be like that, but they're hard in the center. Uh, and they appear the same. One of the things that makes them really distinctive is that they're monomorphic. They are one thing that looks identical after the other, after the other. And this is something that pox viruses do. Um, and they can appear in little crops too. One of the problems with this sort of cropping thing is that if an infection becomes really severe, they can come together and then you get all of that stuff sloughing off at the same time. And that can lead to these subsequent infections like, because you have big open sores. So that's if things get severe. There are reasons to take this seriously. I think that we have become accustomed long before COVID, but definitely with COVID to using death as the bar by which we judge whether something is important or severe. MPXV is a highly scarring virus. It leaves people with wounds and skin scars on their face. Um, so it can be very disfiguring. It can cause also encephalitis, um, eyelid inflammation, which is called blepharit um, blepharitis. Uh, like I said, the lesions can coalesce and then you get large sections of skin coming off in severe cases. And that leads to these additional infections that can be very serious. Um, and other complications include pneumonia, loss of vision, corneal infection is a real concern with pox viruses and people do go blind. It's close contact with an infected person or material that's been contaminated by an infected person. And that includes respiratory droplets, um, close contact, hugging, touching, uh, certainly touching of any pustules. Um, and then like any place that the crusts from those pustules may have fallen off, any dishes or things that someone's drank from, you know, so fomite transmission, surface to surface transmission is a route of infection because people can leave crusts and 
know, pustule sap <laughs> secretions <laughs> on things. Um, and then respiratory droplets as well. It can be spread in a similar way to, to COVID in that um, it can carry in the air, but just not for as long because it tends to be in big goblets of respiratory droplets and they just like hit the ground pretty fast. But masking is an effective strategy for preventing infection. Uh, but most importantly, not touching people who, are, who actually have it um, or the things that they're touching without having them disinfected first. So bodily fluids, contaminated toys, towels, beddings. And if you are pregnant, you can transmit it to the fetus. So it can be effectively moved around like that. So while we wait for vaccines, there's some advice that the CDC has released. The language is very qualified. It's very, um, it's not as absolutist as the original language around protections for COVID are. Uh, it's recommended, it's highly recommended, things like that. All right, so if you're sick, here's what you need to do. Avoid contact with people and animals. You need to cover your lesions. You need to wear a mask. You need to isolate for the duration of the illness. Disinfect spaces and shared items. You're gonna be scratching things. You need to use um, a hand sanitizer that's at least 60% alcohol. If you have the rash, but the fever and the respiratory symptoms are gone, so we're in the last 10 days or so of this infection, you need to be covering all parts of the rash so that you're not shedding on things. Because that's the biggest risk, right, is that people can pick it up because they're sitting on a couch that you sat on. You know, like things like that. So you need to be covered. So uh, with clothing, what you cover with clothing, gloves, bandages, wear a mask. In the house, I think, is where a lot of people end up getting the disease because it moves, like I said, through households and through social networks. So the CDC has very specific recommendations about how to clean like a very specific order in which cleaning happens and very specific recommendations for the type of cleaning you're doing. So when you clean, you clean in this order, all soiled waste, bandages, cartons, you know, takeout food, anything that like potentially has a body fluid on it goes into sealed bags. So like Ziploc bags or like big garbage bags. It is sealed unto itself and then gather uh, and then gathered up and thrown out. After you get rid of that kind of stuff, the next thing you're doing is laundry. And when you're doing that laundry, you are wearing a mask. You never shake the stuff that you're handling. And it doesn't hurt uh, to be wearing full coverage clothing and eye protection. I'm adding that just because it's a good idea. But um, then after you're done doing laundry, you're cleaning hard surfaces and household items. Then after that, you're cleaning upholstered furniture and carpet and clothing, uh, carpet and flooring. And you don't dust or sweep. This is, they're really insistent on this. You only vacuum and you only do it if you have a HEPA filter because you don't want the crusts to go up into the air and breathe them in or get them in your eyes. Because pox infections in the lungs and the eyes are serious business. Uh, wear a mask when you're doing all of this stuff. And then uh, the last set of recommendations that they have around just household things is that, look, avoid your pets and keep things clean. The second recommendation, and I think this is a response to COVID, is that you don't need to euthanize your pets if they become ill. That's You don't need to put them down if they, if they get MPXV. And this is like strong, this is very clearly strongly worded in their guidance. Uh, unless a vet tells you that you have to do it, because apparently people did this at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Not very many, but a lot of people um, talked about a couple of cases where this happened. And so uh, they have other things. Don't mask your pets, which I think is probably pretty straightforward, but it's, there's always a possibility that someone will do it. And you certainly don't wipe them with disinfectants or anything like that. The name of the game is avoid. 
They recommend using latex or nitrile gloves. So for actual intimate relations, so when having sex, wearing latex or nitrile gloves, condoms, but condoms only protect a limited amount of your body space. So they're actually suggesting that sex with clothes on is uh, a viable option, which why not? I mean, it's clothes are a barrier. Um, they do recommend avoiding. So this is also about like, if you don't know your, like, if you don't know the exposures that your partner has had, if you have many partners, if having sex is part of your, like how you're making income, they're saying avoiding kissing. Um, they suggest strongly taking a break until two weeks after full vaccination, if it's viable. Um, and to wash your gear, like wash your, not like literally meaning like wash your sex toys and things like that. Uh, they actually go, they have an extended list of, that was something that was really fascinating to read. They had an extended list of suggested toys to wash, which I think it would have been fine for them just to say, wash your sex toys. <laughs> but, uh, but they listed off a long list of, of things connected to it. So, um, they have a, a, really nice packet put together talking about different levels, like different locations for risk. Um, and they're trying to be sensitive to the fact that some people ha have sex for a living. Like, so um, certainly if you're one of those people, you should, you're eligible for the vaccine. So, you know, trying to get into, to get one uh, when it's available would be a good idea. largest group of life on earth without question. There are viruses that prey on bacteria. You know, it's, it's huge. Now those aren't a concern for us, um, except in so far that they can pass genes to a bacteria and maybe make a bacteria more virulent by accident. But, um, but in terms of the things that are emerging, uh, there've been a lot of talk pieces on just positive stranded RNA viruses <laughs> and just RNA viruses in the last uh, couple of years and the estimates are pretty big. So consider that for every identified emergence, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of spillover events that happen just one time and are self-limited. And the more that we cut into other organisms you know, habitats, the greater the overlap is between us and other life forms, the more of these we run into. And so for the example with SARS-CoV-2, it's pretty straightforward. We encroach on bat habitats all the time. We, we have a bad habit of living and using the things that bats want to like live and use. And not only that, but we mine their poop. For if you look at the back of any bag of like, fertilizer, particularly if you look at the fancy potting soils, bat guano's in there. And it's considered to be a uh, ecologically better alternative than to like chemically produced fertilizers, which while that might be true, guano mining is one of the ways that you pick up diseases, right? So we have a tent, like even in our own agricultural practices, we put pigs and cows and stuff in locations where bats want to be. So the notion that say SARS-CoV-2 emerged because someone ate a bat, possible, people eat bats. Bats are actually commonly eaten all over the world. <laughs> it's like, it's really, really common. So very possible, but we do lots of other crappy things to bats that lead to the potential for spillover. And that's just one family of viruses, right? That's just coronaviruses alone. And we treat a lot of other organisms this way. So we have thousands and thousands and thousands of spillover events that stop at one person. And we don't know, we never see them, we have no idea. Um, certainly the fastest emerging group of pathogens is RNA stranded viruses. So it's a hard number to get a handle on, but it's a lot, it's big. And it's by and large human driven. <laughs>